Uh, it's um, Bethan Cowley, um, and uh, she's the lead ICC nurse specialist for the Royal Brompton and Heraldic Hospital with a great experience managing inherited cardiac condition patients and their families. Uh, Bethan is going to talk about the clinic and screening for first degree relatives. And Bethan, is this time to personalize the approach? Well, I'll let you. Well, first of all, hello, everyone. Good afternoon and thanks for um, inviting me to talk today. Um, I guess I'll leave that up to you to decide at the end. Um, so I've kind of changed the title a little bit and I hope you don't mind. Just in view of the recent publication of the cardiomyopathy management guidelines. So perhaps we can discuss that and, um, at the end and, and see what everyone thinks. So, um, as mentioned, my name is Bethan Cowley. I'm a clinical nurse specialist and lead nurse for inherited cardiac conditions at the Royal Brompton Harefield Hospital. I've been working here now for about within the team for about 12 years, but actually it's always the familial screening side of things that's always really interested me. So I'm delighted to talk about it today. So a couple of aims um, for this very quick whistle stop. Um, show of familial screening. So I'm sure it's already been discussed plenty of times before, but just want to make you aware of what specifically or not specifically said even within the ESC guidelines um, in terms of family screening in cardiomyopathies, uh, what's been recommended and perhaps what hasn't and what we were hoping for. Um, understanding some of the challenges and barriers to family screening, because I think unless we really know what that is, then we're not sure whether or not we need to rethink it or personalise care. And I'm not just talking with the clinical um, uh, mandates or guidelines even around screening. I'm talking beyond the clinical setting as well. And also just to gain a little bit of insight into possible future of um, familial screening and what is currently being looked at. So first and foremost, I'm sure we all do know, but it's good to have a, a quick recap. So the role of screening, um, family screening in any, um, well, in most um, inherited conditions, not just inherited cardiac conditions, is to identify family members that might be at this, uh, might be at risk or predisposed to a certain familial condition. So in our case, cardiomyopathies. But a lot of people forget this, but it's also about identifying those people who aren't at risk as well and being able to reassure them and, and discharge them and um, guide them through that process as well. And there are many, many guidelines that have come out over the years. So heart to heart, we've got the, um, the chapter eight of the uh, National Service Framework. We've got the NHS England ICC service specifications. And of course, there's been various ESC um, publications, particularly the HCM publication, um, and more recently our brand spanking new guidelines. And they all recommend family screening of first degree um, family uh, relatives. So that would be parents, siblings and children. And in the absence of a first degree relative, then they do recommend that you could possibly look to second degree relatives. Um, they also mentioned actually a review with a specialist within cardiomyopathy or in a specialist ICC centre. Um, it doesn't mention if that's a one off or if it's a this is historical, that is, or whether or not that's um, a partnership shared care. And again, for the same people and they have previously in different documentations recommended one to five yearly screening, depending on age and the type of cardiomyopathy you've got. And of course, they all recommend genetic testing if it's indicated. So here are the, um, here's a nice flow chart from the 2023 guidelines. And um, it's pretty much what I think we're all ex expecting. And, you know, if we follow the left side of the flow chart where we identify a pathogenic variant or a likely pathogenic variant, and we're able then to offer predictive testing to family members, and if they don't have it, we can discharge them. That's all brilliant, well and lovely. And that's fantastic. And that's what everyone hopes to be able to achieve and do. But it's actually these pathways here that cause us a little bit more trouble and a bit more thinking required around what we do next with with these people that are at risk. Whether that's with a known genetic cause, so they've got a, um, a genotype or whether there's no genetic information, but an obvious familial disease in the family. So just a quick snapshot of what has been mentioned um, within the 2023 guidelines. So all first degree relatives of patients with cardiomyopathy should be offered clinical screening 
and that is with ECG or some sort of um, cardiac imaging, whether that's echo and or MRI. Um, those relatives harboring the familial genetic variant should undergo regular, and I emphasize the word just regular, clinical evaluation with ECG, cardiac imaging, plus other investigations, so i.e. halter and things like that. And this should be guided by age, family phenotype, and what the genotype is if it's known. And then probably the other one of the most important things is if a genetic cause of the disease has not yet been identified, either because um, there's no pathogenic variant or likely pathogenic variant um, uh, identified or is absent in the proband, then um, obviously we don't offer genetic testing to family members, but we, what we do do is offer clinical um, evaluation to all of those first degree family relatives. So, then it comes to the issue with frequency. So, and they talk a little bit around this within um, in various different parts of the guidelines and in a dedicated um, section too. Um, and what they say is that the frequency of family screening is kind of dependent on the inheritance pattern. And what we know about cardiomyopathies is that largely um, they are inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. And that's again where most of the guidelines kind of focus around really when it comes to screening. Um, the risk of events in affected individuals or individual within the family. So by that, I'm presuming they're meaning if there's been any sudden cardiac deaths within the family or other um, large um, and worrisome events. And um, quality adjusted life years. But then in addition, they say that things like age, type of cardiomyopathy and the family history with respect to expression and again, events and penetrance are also um, factors that should affect the frequency of familial screening. Um, they suggest that up to the penetrance is seen in the, about approximately, well, actually less than 5% in the first decade of life. This then increases to about 10 to 20% per decade from the second to the seventh decade of life. And then it kind of flattens and peters out um, in almost like a sigmoid kind of pattern to 5 to 10% in the last decades of life. So from 60 up. So in a nice easy table, um, this is what has been lifted, what I've lifted from the guidelines. Um, so actually, it, it's pretty much this in a nutshell, if I'm being honest. So from 0 to 60 years, um, family members, first degree family members, where, it, where there hasn't been an identified variant in the family, or if they have a genotype, should be offered an ECG echo every one to three years and additional um, investigations if needed. After 60 years, then we can increase the frequency we see them to three to five years. Um, and then there's a couple of special considerations in there, and there's some other bits that are outlined throughout the, the um, document. Um, so if there's a cardiomyopathy in isolation, and by that they say a really big, oh, well, not a really big, that's not quite the term they use, but if you've got a, a large family um, history, a family tree where you've got good size that you've evaluated and looked for inheritance patterns, if it's a cardiomyopathy in isolation, um, there's no cardiac manifestations um, within family members, then you can consider terminate screening at 50 years of age in those family members that have been screened. Um, and I don't think that particularly is currently happening at the moment in practice. Um, and then they say that um, other, inheritance pattern, other inheritance patterns apart from autosomal dominant, you can think about individualized periodic surveillance of relatives. So those that might be heterozygous carriers for a for an autosomal recessive could potentially be discharged. Um, and those heterozygous for X-linked diseases don't say dis discharged, they say perhaps potentially delayed. And then there are other things that they mention about women, that penetrance in women specifically compared to men, that they may have a delayed penetrance of up to 10 years. Um, so again, these are these are other things that we know can affect onset and, and with an, an expression within cardiomyopathies but not really necessarily being linked into what we're being guided on. So this then brings me on um, quite nicely to some of the barriers and challenges within um, familial screening. So I don't know what you think, but there's still no particularly clear guidance um, and it's still very open to interpretation. And um, I um, had a meeting um, with um, over 60 ICC nurse specialists across the UK um, the other week and actually this is one of the things it was our first meeting this is one of the one of the things that was brought up um, was that 
you know, not brought up as such, but more so what are you doing in family screen? How often are you seeing people? What are you doing? So even amongst the specialists that are, are working in the area and, and, and experience, there's still some ambiguity, not only from centre to centre, but actually within centres, if you've got a, a number of, of cardiologists. And that's not guidelines folks but that's more so down to the fact that there's there's a lack of research in the area and you can see these in the guidelines because not you know they're experts and they're fantastic and, and we we like their consensus on things when there is no research but this is still very much dependent on on on, on a consensus expert statement and not on any hard and fast research unlike some other areas within within the um, guidelines um, they talk about the impact of non-genetic, polygenic, modulators, modifiers, um, environmental factors that can all affect the expression and the severity um, of cardiomyopathies, because we know they're very heterogeneous and no more so than if you look at dil dilated cardiomyopathy. But again, the guidelines is very much as it was and as I showed. Um, and I guess some of the other challenges that this guidelines have brought up in terms of family screens. Now, what, what's next for our, for our people out there that have trabeculation, formerly known as um, non-compaction? So we do have a lot in our service, some that have been diagnosed with cardiomyopathy, but they do have relatives now that are being screened. So what are we going to be doing? And this will probably be only a transient thing, but what are we going to do with that population? How are we going to counsel them around now you don't have a cardiomyopathy? So this is something that needs to be thought of as well. There's no particular um, guidance within that, with, within the um, recommendations. And then, of course, there's the non-clinical issues that we need to think about. So service provision. Um, I think anyone who's here at the moment work in any area, God forbid, not just cardiomyopathy or ICCs, knows that actually the amount of family screening that we do see within, within clinics is just, just increasing. And although genetic testing is becoming more available and we're getting more hits, maybe around 40 to 60 percent of those people that have been genetically tested, for example, in HCM, um, there's still a lot of people that are in our clinics that are being screened. Um, now, in the guidelines, it does mention that it's highly recommended that these people with cardiomyopathy do get seen by um, a specialist or have some sort of shared care with a specialist. Again, we don't know if that's a, a, a transient thing, so open to interpretation or an ongoing thing. But the fact is more family screening, more, more and more people are coming forward for family screening because we're picking up just because of imaging and the, 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 um, the effectiveness of ICC services. We're, we're um, a product of our own good work. But this is something we really seriously need to think about. Um, and then there's obviously the familial screening an issue of the initial uptake of family screening. And we, we know it's a problem. And then ongoing family screening. So standard practice, as we all know, is that we um, often send out contact letters via the proband. Now, that's to recognise good clinical practice around any kind of genomic healthcare is that we don't call cold call people. And actually, we use the proband or an index patient as, as the gateway person. Um, and that can be via family screening letters. It could be word of mouth. But again, this this is open to a lot of problems and, and we know it because family conflict can be an issue in terms of information sharing, privacy concerns, not wanting to cause upset or concern. And also, you know, probably one of the biggest things is not being able to relay the correct information to family members. And there has been research more so in um, um, cancer genetics and cancer services and it showed that you know in su some studies that only 40 percent of people came forward for screening um, and then in other studies it showed that only 20 to 40 percent of people were aware of their genetic risk when contacted um, as part of some research and I think we can safely say that this has probably mimicked quite well across cardiac genetics as well and there are obviously other barriers to family screening uptake. So some people, they say it's not convenient due to service locations. We know that a lot of ICC services are regional in nature. That is hopefully getting better. We're seeing more and more specialist services cropping up. Um, but people do not come forward because they say we are too far away. Um, they perceive themselves as well and therefore not at risk. And we know that um, being well doesn't mean you're risk free. 
and that can become a problem. Um, they might have had a previous normal screen, um, might have had that done locally, or they might have had a normal ECG with their GP and then think that there's no need for ongoing screening. There's also a lack of understanding, and this comes a lot with any kind of genetic or inherited conditions in any fa in families. And some of the cultural or family beliefs around how that condition plays out. And I have heard before, any men get it in our family, where we know it's an autosomal dominant pattern, but just by chance, lots of men have it in that family. People are anxious about diagnosis, and then obviously the problems with implications of employment will prevent people coming forward, um, and insurance. Um, and then, you know, GPs love them, and it is getting better, but sometimes they can be a bit reticent when it comes to referring people to specialist services. Um, and I did a focus group with 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 some um, patients undergoing family screening, and this was probably one of the through um, thematic analysis. One of the overriding themes was their issues with the GPs not giving them the help to be referred and how difficult it was to be referred in the first place. And that was highlighted in the um, Heart to Heart report many moons ago, but we still see it as an issue here now, now today. And then there's obviously there's issues around socioeconomic backgrounds. It's, I think, evident and it's evident and documented and researched in larger scale um, health screening um, programs and initiatives, not just in uh, disease screening um, initiatives, but there is a definite cohort of people that come forward for these, and it's usually white, um, Caucasian, um, middle-aged, um, good socioeconomic background. Um, a lot of minority ethnic groups don't come forward for screening, um, disadvantaged people, non-speaking English people, people live in different areas within the UK don't have access not only to clinical screening but perhaps to genetic testing too. So going back to the barriers and challenges I guess leads me quite on nicely then to one of my, my last slide in fact and I, I guess you're hoping to see more about the future but from what I understand and from what I know I think polygenic risk scores uh, hopefully going to play a lot in terms of maybe identifying those who are specifically at risk and at what point and what environmental factors and other variants um, contribute to disease expression within the family. And, you know, there is, I understand, there is work towards that end and using AI to make specific uh, algorithms to, to potentially look at this going forward. Um, and I guess that links in quite nicely with the research side of things. There is a lack of research around family screening um, in terms of uptake, um, in terms of pickup rate, um, and a lot more work needs to be done to that end. And again, I know that there are people doing this, but it probably needs to be done on a, on a wider scale. And I think Cardiomopathy UK have this. I don't know if you've seen the recent information that's come out and requests for research ideas, but on some of their nominated question ideas, that has that it does play a part in that. Um, and then there's the um, NHS England ICC service specifications. So um, they were last published in 2013. I think that was the first publication, actually. And I know that they're being written again now. So I'm hoping that with some of these things that have been raised in terms of family screening and uptake and outreach, and I don't like to use the phrase, but hard to reach. It sounds like it's their fault. It's not. Those kind of populations and people. Um, this can be something that can be tackled within those service specifications. And also about um, service um, evaluation and how we can better manage these people. And that may involve as well um, patient initiated follow up. So it works very, very well in other areas and other chronic conditions. And these are chronic conditions. Family screening is a bit different, though, because as we mentioned, um, being symptom free doesn't mean you're not risk free. So we, we don't think we'd ever be able to go to a patient initiated follow up um, framework when it comes to family screening cardiomyopathy. But it could be a hybrid approach whereby you have a results clinic, um, bring them in every year or every two years, depending on where they how old they are and everything else, um, offering them imaging, offer them maybe um, other investigations like ECG or Halter if, if you're concerned relay those results through a results clinic, 
and then bring them back again in a few years. But contact us soon if you develop symptoms. So I think PIFU does play a role in this group, but it has to be tweaked around this specific population. And then it's really, really important that we focus on those issues, clinical pre-screening. So how we better um, uh, um, identify patients in clinic, how we better reach them, how we can get the correct information to them without causing alarm. And also, you know, not being too medically centric about it. And, and I think that can be an issue with current screening um, for, uh, for cardiomyopathy is that, again, this was one of the other outcomes that came from the project that I did, is that they felt very medicalized. Um, and you can see how that would be the case. They're coming into clinics where there are people with cardiomyopathy and are very unwell. And these are young, some of them are young, well people coming in for the same investigations. So that's something I think we also need to look at. But like I said, I hope that NHS um, England ICC service specifications cover some of this, these issues. Um, and I hope in a few years time, we'll have a lot more with regards to polygenic risk scores. And um, so we will see. Anyway, so thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if it's questions now or later. So thank you very much, Beth. And that was, again, another very eloquent talk. Um, so we have uh, a couple more aspects to go before we uh, reach a panel discussion for questions. Um, so thank you again. The whole approach that you went through is 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 really key. And, and again, you've highlighted some of the challenges, but also some of the potential opportunities that we have. Um, so thank you very much.